7.45 a.m. on February 24th, 2020. For various reasons, I felt like I was supposed to look into this here bin, this um, cardboard box inside the bin. I have, n I'm not certain if this is, I don't think this is a random arrangement of stuff on in this bin, although I'll, I'm not certain, but since I felt like compelled to look in here, it makes me think that um, this is stacked up in a certain way, especially because I've seen images similar to some of this stuff in dreams. So, for example, on the top is this binder, which has got some, I, you know, I think I was going to put my daughter's artwork or something in here at some point. So it's just got these plastic pages in it with nothing. It's just plastic. But the binder is this plastic-covered cardboard, similar to something I'd seen in a dream earlier, the Pan Am bag or something. It wasn't a Pan Am bag. It was a bowling bag of plastic-colored cloth. And it says Oregon on it. And under underneath that, the next thing in the stack is a funeral program for my daughter's aunt, Margaret Carlson, or um, Margaret Helen Fry Carlson. This is Woodsy Carlson's mother, the first wife of my daughter's uncle, Willard Carlson. And her family is linked with um, Blue Creek, the high country, and. Um, she died suddenly of, I believe, a stomach ailment, and I think she was assassinated with an implant. So that's the first thing that is there. The next thing that is there is something I wrote called Following in Her Family's Footsteps. I wrote this for True Hoyle. I think I should probably read this. So I'm going to, but True Hoyle is the person I pointed out. She grew up for part of her childhood in the home of Melinda Moore, which was down the street from where I grew up. And her father was Rush Dolson, who was um, an elect early, like, electrical engineer, like a hundred years ago. So I'm finding lots and lots and lots and lots of links to a hundred years ago, around World War One era. Um, a bunch of stuff seems to have happened around that time, linked to my situation, set, setups. Um, I mean, as they were paving the way for what was going to happen later on. And um, True Hoyle, her father was Rush Dolson. Her grandfather was M.P. Roberts, who owned the land where the Masonic Lodge is in Sunny Bray. Um, Rush Dolson owned, he may have owned the land that I grew up on, but he definitely owned the land down the street earlier, again, a hundred years ago. So then I ended up working for True Hoyle in the 90s, not having any clue about any of the stuff going on, um, and it probably was not accidental that I was brought together with her. So I will read that. Next thing in the stack is this card. Now, when I saw this card, I immediately thought, oh, this is something linked to my mother because my mom had these cards. Um, she must have had a big box of them because it seems like they were around forever. But in fact, inside the card is something I wrote to my grandparents. This is a thank you note for, I think, a Christmas gift, right? Something like that, yeah. So they must have sent me a check. And I wrote a thank you note immediately. So they, I think they sent intended to send checks for something like, I don't remember. It was Later it was $50. It might have been a little less at this time. Anyway, so... 
I bought a pair of black Reebok high top shoes and wear them for work and school. They are excellent walking shoes. I wear them almost every day. They're so these are the shoes that I would wear all the time. These black high top shoes and I was working as a waitress and a bartender at the time. So shoes were important. And I was attending college at Humboldt State. Again, December 1991. This is less than a year before I'd meet my daughter's father. Um, and then I drew this picture with all the stars and tree and everything. And a moon. Then beneath that is a Christmas letter from just last Christmas from my father's younger sister Judy and her husband and her kids and her grandkids and she of course writes a lot of code in her letters so a 50th wedding anniversary and a number of other extraordinary events as well maybe I will come back to this um Like I say, all of this stuff is coded stuff. My... Both Judy and John, I believe, worked for the federal government. I'm not sure if Judy worked for the federal government, but I believe she worked for some government agency involved with Native Americans. Before that, she was a stay-at-home mom. I think once the, her kids were in high school, she was working for a government agency dealing with Native American something or other. It might have been a child welfare agency of some sort, but I can't remember exactly what. I didn't really, I really had a lot of contact with this family, especially since high school. And, um... Even before that, I didn't have a whole lot of contact with them. But there's, oh, there's, the contact that I have had has been pretty um, significant. Then, here's a letter from the United States Department of Education right beneath that, Office for Civil Rights. This is about my, my Title IX complaint against P Portland Community College. And I have not really done a deep dive into that yet either but um i think right here i think the whole series of stack here is about relationships overall so generally speaking what i think is coming out i mean there's other things that are coming out like um relationships but the thing that's really starting to stand out to me is that the sexual abuse that happened to me is actually linked to the United States government. And that would then, of course, lend further support to the um, narratives of Kathy O'Brien and Bryce Taylor And that also, you know, it also just, this this whole thing just so much needs to end. Um, it, it it would explain so much. It would explain why this whole Pizzagate thing gets treated so lightly and tritely and why people who actually do make claims about children being abused by people linked to the United States government are discounted and not ever given um, serious consideration. Um, and... Um, there's a lot of other things because there's other things it linked into this including drug trafficking um, especially I think well first of all pharmaceutical drugs but also cocaine, heroin marijuana and speed then underneath this uh, so what the, ne the, the last thing in the stack that we had was this um, 
Title IX response. I'm going to come back to that. After that is this paper that I'd been saving that actually has an illustration of the situation um, and the links to pop culture and Hollywood um, and this idea that this is a big show, right? And there's the stars. So it's kind of like almost like a little map. And is this person up here represent a specific person? Is it like Atlas? Is it, No, it's not Atlas because he's not holding. I keep thinking Calvin Johnson when I see this because it looks like a young Calvin Johnson to me. And it might actually be intended to represent a young Calvin Johnson. So he's rolling down this money, a film roll. And then there's this money sun or something like that corpse flower perfume take the money and run best musical sightseeing tour hey wanna apple says this lizard type creature hell patrol no return have your tickets ready chicken running saying get me out of here valley of the shadow of death and all this 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 thing i think that was from ghostbusters that giant whatever that was and you can see the um electrical he's got his hand on the electrical grid as well so in one hand he's got a film reel and the other hand he's got his hand on uh the electrical grid this came out when did this come out it's this comics paper now i think Papers like this are funded somehow because, you know, they're not making any money. This was a free paper. It was being distributed in Portland. There's different things like this that come out that they just, I just think that they're funded somehow for some reason because perhaps the uh, message, messaging in the comics is of interest to someone. It doesn't have a date on it, but this, I know I picked this up in 2014, so I've kept it for a while. I think that the whole point of this paper is just looking at the right now. I think the whole point of this was to encourage these, you know, these rats. In other words, these people who are spying and engaged in um, organized stalking, organized harassment, things like that. It was just sort of to encourage them and egg them on. And I think whoever funded this paper, that was what this was about. And then, you know, it's under the guise of supporting art, but it's art with an agenda. And then after that, this is interesting. I'm really surprised that I saved this. This is my notes from a paralegal class I was taking at Portland Community College. And this was just a week before I quit going to school there because I couldn't take the harassment anymore. And I did not like the guy at all who gave this talk. Um, he was doing a lot of signaling obnoxious signaling that amounted to harassment from my perspective because it was about me but I didn't even realize that this actually this talk took place exact and this is this talk was about accident reconstruction so people who are making cl claims based on car accidents and things like that how these independent contractors go through and expert witnesses for um, court cases basically and reconstruct accidents to see, try to see exactly what happened so that they can show in a court situation, reconstruct an accident. This was exactly 10 days before my daughter's cousin Stormy was killed in a car accident. Exactly. I don't think that's an accident. Did the guy that was making this talk know? I think there's a decent possibility that he knew that my daughter's cousin was going to be killed. Again, leaving two young boys without a mother. Um, but besides that, she was she was uh, my daughter's favorite cousin. Was, my daughter is very close to her. My daughter has no brothers or sisters, and that was a huge impact on her. And I'm sure that was part of the goal. It wasn't just about the cousin herself. It was about traumatizing people around her, including her children and my daughter. And underneath this is a plastic binder, which I don't recognize. My daughter might have given it to me. It's, you know, she gave me some binders. I'm not sure. It's got 
all these it's purple plastic it's got all these swirls and it's got a star on it beneath beneath that a letter from Erica Schlager written on birch bark something we played around with back in the day this is from September of 1990 She used to live, at this time she was living in a warehouse on California Street in Minneapolis. And then beneath that is some, you know, scrapbooks that I've been making. And beneath the scrapbooks is my, some poetry of mine. And things, it might be them beneath that. What is this? This might be something of mine from grade school. I don't know how far down the stack is significant. So this is something that I did in grade school. Freshwater school, baby animals, it says. It looks like it's backwards. I didn't know, I guess, how books were supposed to open at this time. Looks like a quail, birds. More birds. Um, there's a decent possibility that stuff like this was used for occult purposes, you know, to decide how to manipulate situations. This too is something of mine that my mom saved from grade school. So I think that underneath this then is a bunch of stuff of mine. Dead, 1865, it's kind of dark. Um, a bunch of stuff of mine from grade school that my mom saved and most of it I figured out was from 1974 which is the year that both of us could have been killed in horse accidents her, my mom's back was broken because her horse fell into a booby trap and um, I was put on a horse with a loosened cinch on a, on a pony where the cinch was loosened and the saddle went sideways this is my pictures of Abraham Lincoln Okay, so that could be another thing to go through. That There's other things in here that I might want to look at. But, so, um, Andrew Robel is gone now, off to Singapore. He asked for your address, and he left us another Andrew I haven't talked about much that was an artist from, I think he was from Montana, and had been a cowboy. He looked kind of like a Marlboro man. He was an older guy. His thing was taking pieces of plastic. One of the things he did was take plastic and melt it together and make sort of like cloth-like um, things out of melted plastic. So, accident reconstruction. This is only one piece of the whole puzzle with Stormy. There's many, many, many pieces that tell me that what happened to Stormy was a murder. But these three I want to look at in this one. In fact, even the silver on the inside of this envelope for my aunt is significant. So, what I think, one of the things going on first of all, this one was in there upside down, so there's a list of family in here. Involved family. Um, and the other is just, it, this is kind of the back of the family. 
in other words, um, yes, all these people are involved, but it's also kind of the back. So I was around this family all the time for four years. I had no clue what was really going on. Another thing to look at are the dates. She was born on March 15th, and she passed away on March 22nd. Um, so just keep those dates in mind. March 22nd was the day that Bertha um, Thompson was buried. I remember that. She was... Um, Bertha Thompson died March... I believe it was March... can't remember the exact day. It was twenty it was nineteen twenty four. I think she died on March nineteenth and was buried on March twenty second. This one I come back to I do want to, now that I, now that I look back, at first I thought, when I saw this, I thought they did an okay job with it, other than the fact that they denied my claim, which they shouldn't have, because I was harassed very badly at the school. Um, now when I look back at it, I think they belittled me. You know, like, some, saying somebody sniffed loudly once, being a harassment issue, that's not what happened, people were constantly, constantly harassing me. Um... So we'll get back to that. But the thing about this is, is I filed this complaint before I realized that I had been targeted my whole life. I just thought I was being targeted based on something about Chris. And that was very confusing to me. So I have a lot more information now. Not that that would matter. But once again, I'm now making the assertion that the United States of America has actually been sex trafficking me. And other children too. But um, the sexual harassment is, is directly linked to the United States federal government. Um, but I've gotten the hint that this is also being, um, the situation was also manipulated by Seattle, s people linked to Sub Pop, but possibly also my family. So this is where it's, this is why I think this, the sequence was important because it's the backside of the Thompson and the Carlson family and probably also, and also the Fry family. And then underneath that was... What was next? True Hoyle. I can't remember. Um, I think it was this. It might have been this. In any case, the point that they're, the point I think that's being made is that this family, which is a you know prominent Masonic family, um, linked to this family, linked to basically surrounding my family. I don't think, you know, I don't know to what extent my mom voluntarily entered into this or, you know, she was obviously groomed into it. That's the only way to really describe it. And so was so were these guys. But um so me doing stuff like this, I don't have any clue about the deeper meanings of the tree and the snow and the star and the moon and all of that. I just think they're pretty decorations when I draw this. Um, and then these folks, okay, so these folks set me up, and what I think the message is, is that they set me up on behalf of the United States government, and they set me up to be sex trafficked. And the fact that she's linked with something having to do with Native American children is extremely disturbing to me, knowing all of this. Right. So, you know, they they're working on the same team, but are they really? I don't think so. I think that, you know, I think like I have said over and over, I mean, I think this is a betrayal about to happen. And I, this is already a betrayal that happened. She was murdered. She died from a sudden issue with her in, in intestines or, or digestive system, if that's correct, which is exactly how 
um, Chris's grandmother died. And my grandfather also died from stomach cancer. And I also have implants in my stomach. And Chris has implants in his stomach. And there's all these signs that my daughter has implants in her digestive system as well. That's some pretty nasty stuff. So, no, I don't think. I think that this is a betrayal situation. So, um, I'm going to read this. The way that this worked was I was working for True, who had had a stroke. Um, she was in her 70s. Um, I suspect the whole thing was a setup. Um, I'm not saying that True was adversarial to me necessarily. Um, in fact, it's just totally possible that the opposite is true. Um, and by the way, I, so I handled a lot of stuff with True. I was sort of like her, you know, the person that would, I would cook meals. I would do research for her. I helped her write these things. Um, she donated a lot of her stuff to the Humboldt Room because she was an archivist and um, her family was deeply tied with um, Arcata going back to the early days of white settlement. So um, by having me write these stories, she was basically instructing me, you know, in things that would later become helpful to me maybe in, in certain, with certain clues. So that I, I can't find any evidence that, you know, her relationship with me was adversarial. I feel that the opposite is true. Was true herself linked to the order of the Eastern star. She was linked to lots of different organizations that were kind of, pro, you know, Masonic like in nature. But I do remember specifically, and whether this was misdirection or not, I don't know. But I remember specifically, she was getting stuff in the mail from Order of the Eastern Star. But she kind of, she indicated to me she was not involved with that group. Um, and the way she did it made, it made me think that she was not interested in being involved with that group. But, you know, whether or not that was misdirection, I have no idea. But I suspect that maybe she knew that that group was up to um, things that she didn't want to be involved with. That's what I think. So here's what I wrote. Her grandfather was a prominent Arcata politician and her grandmother's a charter member of the Arcata Women's Club. Now Arcata Women's Club president, True Dolson Hoyle, carries on a family tradition of intelligence, hard work, and community service. I think I wrote this about 1992 with her. So I wrote that most, maybe I won't read the whole thing because it's long. Um, so I'm describing her as a fourth generation Arcadian. Devoted much of her life to church and community activities as well as to raising her own three children. So she was a member of the Presbyterian Church. My husband, Bert, says I belong to 26 clubs, but I'm only, really only active in four or five of them. So this includes the Daughters of the American Revolution, Native Daughters of the Golden West, um, 26 years as an instructor for the American Red Cross, and 29 years teaching in public schools, nine years on the Arcata City Planning Commission, and has been house historian for the Arcata Historical Site Society and the Arcata Women's Club. And she did, I think I said this, but I just want to make sure that she donated her archives to the Humboldt State University library and um, so there's a special True Hoyle collection there now. So I say she's following in the footsteps of her grandmother Mae Nelson Roberts, the daughter of a Danish sea captain, lived at Little River near Trinidad. So Trinidad is Yurok territory. Um, born in 1887. May's husband, M.P. Roberts, was born in 1841 in St. Albans, Maine, and had come to California at the age of 19 via the Isthmus of Panama, was a farm worker, miner, and lumberman, purchased a 197-acre ranch east of Arcata. 
This was in 1887. And then it was eventually 225 acres. My grandfather is credited with starting the first commercial dairy in Arcata, True says. That was around 11th Street. Then in 1882, he moved it to where the lofts and Bayside apartments are now. So Bayside Road between Arcata and Sunny Bray, that was M.P. Roberts land. Um, the dairies are really connected with me, and that goes back at least 100 years. So, you know, that's a clue that M.P. Roberts was connected with orchestrating the situation that would bring my family to Humboldt County. So she talks about... Um, the family living in this house, which is now called the Phillips House. It's the oldest standing house in Arcata. It's now a museum. So that can be found on the map. It's still there. Um, True's mother is named Atlant. I find that an interesting name. This word Atlantic, Atlant, all that kind of stuff keeps coming up again and again. I wonder if that's linked to the idea of the Eastern Star, since the Atlantic Ocean is on the east coast of the United States. In 1901, True's grandfather, M.P. Roberts, went to Sacramento and served eight years as a state assemblyman. Um... Yeah, so he was uh, involved in changing wetlands into pasture land. And she recognized that that's a different concern back then that people